be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to see you here this morning. It is great to see many of you that have been sick and some of you that have been traveling. It's great to have everyone back here this morning. Sans this small section right here, um, which is completely empty. So if anybody wants some room and you're in the crowded sides, there's actually some space here in the center if you would like to have that. Hey, we've got, uh, if this is your first time here with us this morning, we want to welcome you. And if, if it is, uh, there's a white card you will see in the chair in front of you. That is our Connect card. Take a moment to fill that out this morning so that we have a record of your visit and we can make contact with you. On the way out this morning, you just drop those in the receptacles um, that are on either side of the door there. A couple announcements for this morning. Number one is that we have a church council meeting after service. So service will end and about 15 minutes later, we will have church council over in the library. Second thing is we have our Advent devotionals. If you missed those, we are on day 10 now. And uh, hopefully everyone that got one has been going through that. It's been an encouragement and a blessing to us, our family, as we've gone through that each day and just get, getting our focus on Christ and getting our focus on the meaning of Christmas. This week, on December 13th, there is a, a MOPS gathering. It's no longer called MOPS. Last week, I let you know it's now MOMCO, which is the MOMS community. So if, uh, if you would like to come with that or come to that, there's information here, or you can find information on our Facebook page, or you can ask Amy if you have. Amy, raise your hand there. Amy will give you whatever information you need um, for that meeting. This Saturday, the youth group is going ice skating, December 16th. So any of our teenagers that would like to go, just talk to Rick or Julie um, this morning. Uh, next Sunday, which is the 17th, we are having our end of the year meeting, which is our budget meeting and voting on officers that have been nominated for various positions within the church. So uh, this morning, there are copies of the proposed budget for 2024 in the back. You can grab those on your way out. They're in the literature racks. And uh, then next Sunday, we will vote on that, uh, discuss it, whatever we need to do. And that will be a congregation-wide meeting uh, which is after church. We've got a uh, Christmas open house at our house on that same day. So every Christmas, one of the things that, that our family likes to do is to open our home up and invite all of you to come in to our home. Um, we we do usually do that from like one to four this year because we have the church count, we have the church meeting afterwards. Um, we're going to do it one thirty to four thirty. So you're welcome to come and drop in for a short period of time, or you can come and stay the whole time. Sometimes people stay from you know one to four, and sometimes people are there for fifteen minutes. Um, but we want to invite you to that. Heather and Michaela um, and some others will be working to make all kinds of various treats, and so come and enjoy some hospitality, enjoy the food, and uh, spend a little bit of time with us. That's next Sunday. On December 24th, uh, it's a Sunday morning or Sunday, we have our regular morning service that Sunday. And then on Sunday evening, Christmas Eve, we do our annual Christmas Eve service. And for the last three years, we have done that in conjunction with uh, First Baptist Church Lake Isabella. So we will be over there. If you don't know where that's at, it's right there um, on, at, on the intersection of 155 and 178. It's the big church right out there. And uh, that, that'll be from 5, 5.30 to 6.30 next, or, or Sunday the 24th. Uh, we'll take communion. We'll have a cookie fellowship afterwards. So that's just a, <clears throat> it's just a great time for our churches to get together and worship together on Christmas Eve. This morning, I noticed some of you brought some things in for our Christmas meal baskets. We still need quite a few things for that. Um, I had thought we had all of the beans and all of the candy canes, so I marked them off the last list, but it turns out we actually need more candy canes, my wife says, and we also uh, need pretty much everything. So if you are able to bring that um, by next Sunday, there is a list of what's needed in the back over here. So if you are able to bring some of that, what we do every Christmas is we take meal baskets to families that are in need in our community. This, week, this year we're doing 15 of them. And so if you can help us bring some of that stuff in, whatever we don't get, we will go out and purchase all the rest of the things that we need. But, uh, but if you can grab one of those lists on the way out and uh, pick up some things by next week. 
Um, Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we are taking that currently in the seats in front of you. You'll find some envelopes that say Christmas offering or Lottie Moon on them. Uh, This is a missions offering that every Southern Baptist church uh, takes up every Christmas. And the money, 100% of that money goes to the missionaries that we support. The SBC supports uh, 3,500 missionaries all over the world. And one of the unique things that the SBC does is that the missionaries, they don't have to come home and find support. Um, that we fully fund them, and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is a part of that, so that they can go out and do their work and uh, and just take care of what needs to be taken care of on the mission field. So, if you want to contribute to that, there is from now until the end of the year, we will be taking that. On New Year's Eve, we're doing a New Year's Eve game night and potluck, and so put that on your calendars. And then the last thing is we have been collecting money for a thing called Project Amplify. And Project Amplify is something we're doing as a follow-up to our summer mission trip. This summer we went up to Norwich, Ontario in Canada, and we partnered with Camp of the Woods, and we helped get them ready for the, for the winter, and it was, uh, it was a really great time for us. You know, it was hard work cutting wood and stacking wood and, and repairing things and, and helping them get ready for both their summer and then for winter. Um, but we noticed that they needed a new sound system. And so Jason Bachman went out and put together a list of what we needed. And so we've been collecting funds for this. And uh, the good news is it's going to cost us considerably less than we thought, um, but we still are short of what we need in order to get the things that we are intending to get. We, we now have the money to be able to get a soundboard and speakers, but we still have other things that we need to get, such as microphones and cables and things like that. So if you would like to contribute to that, you can contribute to Project Amplify. You can write that on the envelope or check or whatever and drop those in the receptacles there. And uh, if you would like, this is something we'd like to do to, to be able to raise some funds. If you've got Christmas presents you would like wrapped and you don't want to do it yourself, uh, come and talk with me and I will get a group of people together and we'll wrap those presents for you for a small donation to Project Amplify. And that way uh, we're able to add a little bit more to that and then you guys receive some kind of service there. So those are the announcements this morning. And if you just like enjoy, if you just enjoy wrapping presents and you're like, I'll wrap more presents, come and help with that. And, uh, and that would be good because there's always people. I am a I don't like to wrap presents um, person. Um, and I know that there are some people out here that just love it and love to put the bows and do all that other kind of stuff. So come and help me. And uh, we will wrap other people's presents as a way to help with this project. Um, so with that, um, go ahead and stand, take a moment, greet those who are around you this morning, and then we'll continue on in worship in just a moment. From the realms of glory, we your fight or all. In the fields of fighting, watching 
Jesus, we thank you that you have sent your son. Jesus, we thank you that you are the word that became flesh and lived among us and that you as God became a man and you became um, a servant so that and died for us so that we could live. We thank you that you died and you rose again to show us that you have the, paid the price for our sins and that you have conquered sin and you've conquered death, Jesus. And so we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the fact that you came to this earth and we celebrate that in the Christmas season. And we pray that um, as we finish out the series on the Sermon on the Mount, that you would teach us how to, to build our lives upon you, upon your word, and that you would send your spirit here um, to, to dwell in us and to to bless us and to show us how you want us to live in light of the, the words that you've spoken. And so we pray that you would bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. And if you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be in our final segment this morning on the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Matthew 7, verses 24 through 29. Now, ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by skyscrapers. And when I was a kid, the first skyscraper that I ever saw was the, the biggest one that I could see at the time. It was the Sears Tower in Chicago. My dad was stationed just a little bit south of Chicago at, uh, at Rantoul in the uh, in Chanute Air Force Base, and we went up to Chicago one day, and I saw this thing, and it was just an absolute marvel to me. Now, in my earlier years, I didn't give a whole lot of thought in how this thing worked or or how it was all put together, but the older I got, the more I began to think about the engineering and all the challenges that the, the, the people who built this had to overcome in order to build such a monstrous structure. The Sears Tower weighs 445 million pounds. And one of the th- questions that was in my mind over the years is, how does this thing not just collapse in on itself with so much weight 
standing on it. If you know where the Sears Tower stands, you can see the Chicago River. It's only about 500 feet from the shore of the Chicago River, and the sand or the soil underneath it is clay and lake bed soil. So how does this thing not sink or start to lean like the leaning tower of Pisa? Or how does this thing, when there's a lot of water or the river is overflowing, how does this thing not get the base eroded and just tip over on a large portion of Chicago? Well, the answer to that question is obviously the moorings and the foundations. Because even though this building is 1,400 feet tall, underneath it there is this gigantic concrete structure that goes 100 feet down into the bedrock beneath all that compressible soil and clay. And that's what allows this thing to stand, you know, 1,400 feet tall in Chicago. The world's newest, tallest building is the Burj Khalifa in United Arab Emirates in Dubai. And this thing is 2,716 feet tall. And it's sitting on the sands of the Arabian Peninsula. And you would think, man, that's a terrible place to put such a huge building. But again, just like with the Sears Tower, if you look what's underneath it, there are these pylons that go down 164 feet into the bedrock below. And what both of these buildings and every other building like it teaches us is that if, if you have a strong foundation, you can build incredible things upon it. Now that is not just true in building buildings, that's true in building companies, in building relationships, in building a church, and it's, and it's true in building up our spiritual lives as well. If the foundation is strong, then marvelous things can be built on it. Now this morning, we're coming to the very end of the Kingdom Manifesto. We have been talking now for five months about the Sermon on the Mount. We've been going through and we've been hearing the, the, the teaching of the King as he has been laying out his expectations. And this week, we come to the final section on it where Jesus gives us a statement upon the foundation, about the foundation upon which we build our lives. The entire sermon, chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew, are all about building up that that strong foundation so that our lives are solid and secure. Now, while the Sermon on the Mount doesn't address every single issue that we may face in life, it gives us a framework on how to approach life as we are bound here in this, on this earth as sojourners and exiles, and it gives us direction in how we live for the Lord. We are blessed we live for the glory of the king who gave himself for us. We pursue righteousness. We seek after the kingdom. How we live matters and how we represent the king matters. And we have warnings all throughout this sermon about the dangers that we'll face in this world. And so with all of that behind us now, as we've worked our way through all of this, what we're left with is we're left with a choice of how exactly we are going to live. I have a plan, I have a way that's laid out in front of me, but how will I choose to build up my life? And this is where we get in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 29. Follow along with me in your Bible. It says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them it was like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for the teaching he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Now this morning, we're going to unpack this last section of Scripture here with the intent of driving us to the place where we make a choice, where we draw a line in the sand and we say, this is how I'm going to live. I'm choosing to follow this path or this path. This is the way I'm going to live. This is the foundation that I'm going to stand on. It's going to be one or the other. But before we get to the choice of foundations this morning, we need to talk about the, the need for, for the foundation, why it's so important. So the first point this morning is that Jesus gives us in this passage a guarantee of challenges, a guarantee of challenges. Verse 25, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and they beat on the house. If you look down at verse 27, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat against the house. 
Back in the year 2000, which sounds very, like a very long time ago, at the turn of the century, that's how you say it to make it sound really old-fashioned. At the turn of the century, I traveled to Mexico City, and I, I went up into a building called the Latin American Tower. And this building is the tallest building in Mexico City at 545 feet tall. Now, that doesn't seem like a, a, a great accomplishment for us when we're building 1,700 feet tall buildings and the, the, and the people in, in Dubai are building 2,700 feet tall. Saudi Arabia, by the way, is going to build the Jeddah Tower now, which is going to be 3,000 and something feet tall because you can't get beat by your neighbors, right? You got to have the biggest building, I guess. And so this building right here, it, uh, it's 545 feet tall, but that's a, quite an accomplishment in Mexico City because if you know anything about Mexico City, you know that it's built on a volcano and there are all sorts of, of tectonic plate lines and things underneath it, and that place is constantly shaking. And the people who built this tower, this Latin American tower, they started with that reality and they built to accommodate it. They followed the example of the Aztecs. If you go and you look at the Aztec temples and the things that they built, they built structures underground that acted as shock absorbers. So when there were earthquakes, the buildings wouldn't just crumble apart. And so that's exactly what they did with this tower. They put a, a series of, sh of shock absorbers underneath, which gave it flexibility in earthquakes. And this has worked out very well for them because in 1957, there was a 7.8 magnitude quake. In 1985, there was an 8.1, and there was a 7.1 in 2017. And as you can see in these pictures, while big portions of Mexico City were just absolutely destroyed, if you look, flip over to the next picture, what you will see is that even with all the rubble in the streets, this building still stands. Faced with the reality that this building was going to experience all kinds of shaking over the years, they planned ahead. They, they knew they needed to do something to accommodate for the fact that this was going to be moving at all times. And we can learn a lesson from that when it comes to our spiritual lives as well. What's clear in verses 25 and 27 that we read just a moment ago is that trials are coming. If you notice in both of these verses, the house that's built on the rock, the house that's built on the sand, both of them are subjected to the rain and to the wind and to the flooding. It is coming for both of these houses. Now, there are two major schools of thought when it comes to the trials and things that Jesus is talking about here. There are some that believe this is speaking specifically to the trials and the difficulties that we face in this life, and the trials and difficulties in this life are numerous. We will face lots of trials. Other people, they suggest that this is related to the final judgment, so they go back one passage and they say, the, the rain and the wind and the floods, these are the, the judgment of Christ that's going to come upon each and every one of us at the judgment seat of Christ, and I don't see any reason why it can't be both. Because Jesus tells us himself that there are going to be trials in this life. We live in a fallen world, in a fractured and broken world. Now, we know from the scriptures that God gave us a perfect world in which there were, no, there were no trials and difficulties like the ones that we face, but mankind decided that they knew better than God, and in their pride and self-sufficiency, they chose to follow their own way, and as a result of that, every one of us has gone through challenges and difficulties. Everyone in here who has gone through illness, who has gone through, through uh, difficulty in their business, gone through relational difficulties, all the things that we go through, it all traces back to this, God made a perfect world, we we broke the world in our rebellion, and now we suffer the consequences. Now, whether we are Christians or not, whether we follow Jesus or not, we're going to face loss, and we're going to face danger, and we're going to face human cruelty and disease and illness. Our days are going to be filled with sorrows of various kinds, and not a one of us is going to make it out of this world without experiencing tremendous loss. All of us are going to face these things in this world. All of us are going to face difficulties in this life. Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you will have tribulation. In this world, you will have trials. James tells us in James 1, 2, that we're going to face trials of various kinds. Paul repeatedly tells us in his letters that we're going to face trials and tribulations related to our faith and our walk with Jesus and our following of him. It is, it is a part of the life that we live. It's not a matter of if, the winds are going to blow and the rains are going to come and the floodwaters are going to rise. It's a matter of when. So when we read this and when we look at this passage and Jesus here talks about the fact that these things are coming, 
For the one who builds their life on the rock and the one that builds their life on the sand, they're all going to experience this. Furthermore, we have the, the realization from the previous passage and other passages that there is a time coming where we will stand before Jesus and the works of our life will be judged. And those that have been found to be done for him, those things are going to stand and all of those works that are for us and all of those works that we think are true righteousness. Last week we talked about these. They're going to be found to be filthy rags. And so we're all going to face this. These things that, that we place before him. And so we know trials are coming in this life and in the life to come. If we've not built our foundation on Christ, so then we must be ready for them. right? There's a guarantee of challenges, and we, and we know they're coming, so we must be ready for them. Now, if you have ever lived in the Midwest, anybody here ever live in the Midwest or in the Plain States? Raise your hands. So if you live in the Midwest of the Plain States and you see this guy right here, what do you do? <laughs> you, you get to the basement, right? You, you go for cover. You look for safety. If you see that in the sky, you know I have got to go and take, take shelter. I've got to find a safe place. Now that's assuming that you have a safe place because there's actually a decision that comes before the decision to seek a safe place and that's the decision to be ready when that trial comes and when that difficulty comes. Now, I, I have lived in many places in my life where, where there are tornadoes. And so for years of my life, we would drive by these little things right here on the side of the road. Now, those are tornado shelters is what they are. And you dig a big hole in the ground and you stick it down in there. And then when the tornado comes, you go down and you're safe. Now, these are going to do you absolutely no good if the funnel cloud has reached the ground and is already bearing down on you. You climb into one of those things when the funnel cloud is coming, you're just going to get rattled around like a maraca and they're going to find your dead body inside the storm shelter, probably a half a mile away from where you got into it. They do you no good if you haven't planned ahead. You've got to buy the thing. You've got to take it. You've got to bury it in your yard. You have to be ready so that you can get inside of it when the storm comes. If you've driven by these things a thousand times and you've seen them a thousand times and you've never given any thought to the fact that, hey, there's a good reason why these things are being sold here, then when the storm comes, you might find yourself in a difficult place. And the same is true when it comes to the trials of life. If you only ever think about them when they've arrived and you do nothing to prepare for them, you are likely to get tossed and blown about. Preparation is key. Now, we know this is true because the Apostle Paul tells us this is true in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. He talks there about the fact that God has given pastors and teachers and, and other people to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body. And then he goes on to say this, he says, until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God as we mature to the full measure of the stature of Christ. And then he says, then we will no longer be infants tossed about by waves and carried around by every wind of teaching and by the clever cunning of men in their deceitful scheming. You know, to face storms without preparation is a guarantee that we are going to experience some kind of failure in that. Now, whether those storms are the difficulties of life or whether those storms are the, the, the teaching of, of false things, we talked about that in the past couple of weeks, or whether those storms are the, the trials that will come when all of our works are judged before Christ, if we have not given any thought ahead of time to these things, we are going to face more difficulty. Jesus warns his followers in this passage that they're going to get tested when the difficulties come. And if we've been casual about this truth, or we've built up our life on the wrong foundation, it's not going to end well for us. So armed with this reality that storms are coming, that the rains are going to come, that the wind is going to blow, Jesus gives us two choices of the foundation upon which we can build. These two choices are found in verses 24 and 25. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Over in verse 26, he says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
Now, every single human being, whether they realize it or not, has a worldview. Everyone has a base set of beliefs, and everybody has some sort of moral compass that guides them in the direction that they go. Now, some people's moral compass is not really attuned to true north, but we all have them. And this is the foundation upon which our life is built. For some people, their their compass starts with this, family first. So every decision they make is driven by that principle of family first. Some people's compass, it's whatever benefits me, and so therefore their entire life is about following and finding the thing that benefits them. For others, it's leave this world a better place than we found it. But for others still, that foundation and that starting point is the gospel. It's God's word. It's Jesus first. It's what has he told me to do. That's going to be the thing that guides me in this world. Our worldview, our moral compass is what dictates our actions. And they create the framework through which we run every decision. And so in this passage, Jesus gives us the place to start, the foundation upon which to build when he says, these words of mine. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now these words of mine, that encompasses what we've read in the Sermon on the Mount for the past three chapters. But then it encompasses the greater counsel of Scripture because we know from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is, all Scripture is God-breathed. And so what Jesus calls us to do, first of all, is to build on the immovable bedrock of God's Word. So if you want to know the foundation that Jesus is telling us, you want to build on the right foundation, here it is, the immovable bedrock of God's Word. The framework the framework through which every Christian should be making the decisions of their life is this. Jesus is king. My existence is about glorifying him. So what is it that he's told me to do? See, that should be the thing that guides us when we start asking, what am I supposed to be doing in life? How am I supposed to be acting? What am I supposed to be doing with my family or with my community? Always asking the question, what is it that Jesus has told me to do? That is the starting point. And here's the thing about God's word in a world of ever-changing and ever-shifting values and opinions and approaches to truth. It is an unchanging standard. It is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. Our culture might change its mind about what it considers false and true, what it considers right and wrong, what it considers taboo and acceptable, but God's word is not changing. It's not changing. God's not changing his mind and going, oops, I messed up in Matthew 7. Here, let me give you a, a, a different edition. Now, people will change stuff, right? People will go and take stuff. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Jefferson Bible. Thomas Jefferson had a real big problem with miracles, right? He was like, miracles don't happen. He had a very naturalistic worldview. And so Jefferson took and he literally cut sections out of the Bible and then cut and pasted this. And so the Jefferson Bible is like this tiny little thin Bible of just the moral teachings. Now, people might do this, but the fact of the matter is, is that God has not changed his mind. He has given us the truth, and this is the truth upon which we build our lives. God's word is steadfast, declaring what is objectively true for all time. And the words of Jesus give us the framework through which we can live our lives. The Sermon on the Mount is is the most concise and comprehensive summary of what Jesus taught on this earth. And while, like I said before, it doesn't mention every single thing that we might face, the principles that we glean for it are sufficient for living our lives in this world. It instructs on life and it instructs on living and it tells us how we should live. It gives us commands in the way in which we should walk as we live in this world. And this is why Jesus says this. He says, the one who hears and does it the one who hears and does it. And this is where we get ourselves in a lot of trouble as Christians, is we hear it, right? We come to church and we hear it. We listen. We might open our Bible in the morning. We might do a devotion. But then the question is, throughout the day, after we've heard it, are we actually doing what it says? If we will listen and learn and follow it and live it, we will experience the blessings that Jesus promises in his word, and we will live each and every day knowing that we're living a life that pleases the Lord. 
This is what James, the brother of Jesus, teaches in James chapter 1, verse 22. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Otherwise, you are deceiving yourselves. Deceiving yourselves about what? About being a follower of Christ. Follower is, is an action description, right? What does a follower do? Follows. So if you're not following, are you a follower? No, you're a stander, right? Like I'm, I'm, Jesus is going this way and I'm right here, so I'm not following him. So don't deceive yourselves. If you say I'm a follower of Christ, but you're not actually following what Christ teaches, then you're not actually a follower. Now, I'm not saying here that you're not saved, that you haven't been redeemed. What I'm saying is that if we make the claim that we follow Jesus and we don't actually follow Jesus, well, then we're deceiving ourselves. We're not followers of Christ. He continues on in verse 25 of James 1, and he says, but the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and continues to do so, not being a forgetful hearer, but an effective doer, he will be blessed in what he does. It's like the bedrock beneath the Sears Tower and the Burj Khalifa. It's stable. It's immovable. It's unchanging. And Jesus says this. He says, build your life on the rock that is my word. If anyone hears and does, here's the word, and does what I have told them to do. It's like a man who has wisely built the foundation on the rock. But that's not the only choice that we have. That's one of two choices. The other building option is the shifting sands of our own way. So if we're not going to make God's word our foundation, and if we're not going to acknowledge that Jesus is our king, and we're not going to put his word in the place of primacy in our lives, then what exactly are we going to build our lives on? Well, I'm going to tell you, we're going to build our lives on our opinions, our views of right and wrong. We're going to build our lives on our passions and our desires and our prejudices and our view of what's good and bad and what's worthwhile and what's not. And the problem with that is that we are fallen people. I know good and well that I cannot trust my heart to lead me because my heart lies. We're told that in scriptures, right? I'm an expert at twisting things to benefit myself. This is why whenever I have to make a decision, I'm constantly in prayer and I'm constantly asking God, God, you've got to strip me out of this. You got to take my opinions. You got to take my desires. You got to take my passions out of this. And you've got to tell me what it is that you want me to do because I'm really good at convincing myself that the thing that I want to do is the thing that you want me to do. And if we're not building our life on God's word and following what he's told us to do, then one of the ways we're going to do it is we're going to just ask, well, what do I want to do? And that's going to be the thing that we pursue after. Or if we decide to get outside of ourselves and, okay, if I can't trust my own heart in these things and I have to get outside of my own thoughts, opinions, and all this other stuff, we're going to attach ourselves to the values of our culture and of our world. And let me tell you, that's, that's shifting sand. Like that is ever-changing. Those values, those, those interests, you know, they're based on our current mood or our culture's collective current interests. And those things are constantly moving. Now listen, there's some pretty benign things in our culture. Not everything about American culture or American Christian culture, but particularly American culture. Not everything about it is just base and evil at every single level. There's some pretty benign things, but over the past few years, that we've, we've had the veneer of some of this stripped back, and there's some pretty ugly stuff underneath the surface. You know, our culture values wealth and success and celebrity above integrity. How do we know this? Well, because the people that have wealth and celebrity and money oftentimes get away with the things that nobody else could get away with. Our culture doesn't evidence the basic moral sense to know that you should protect the most innocent among us. Our culture can no longer tell you what a man or a woman is. More and more, we're entertaining ourselves through the most base and vulgar things that we can find as a culture. The powerful undertow of our collective abandonment of the traditional Judeo-Christian morals and values has opened the door to unthinkable things. You know, just, just 20 years ago, if somebody was a pedophile, they hid in the dark because all of our society knew that's not something that you should be doing. But now, now they've relabeled themselves as maps, right? Minor attracted people, and they have their own pride flag, and they fly it, and they fly it pridefully as if that's a normal thing that people should be doing. 
Our culture wants to tell you that how you feel trumps what is definitively and demonstrably true. Our culture makes a mockery of the family. Our culture promotes the cult of selfism and self-reliance. Do you know that there was a time when American culture was attractive to people around the world, and now the world just kind of looks at us and thinks we've lost our collective minds, and with good reason, for some of the things that we promote and some of the things that we allow within our culture. We're at that point where, where it's not just like the, the, the very old people that are saying, I never thought I would live to see the day. That phrase is being used by all kinds of people these days. As we look around and we see the things that are going on in our world, our culture is in full rebellion against God and will affirm whatever he says is wrong. So what happens if we decide to make that shifting sand the foundation upon which we build our lives? Whether it's our own opinions of things or whether it's the things that our culture says and that our world says is okay, if we decide to put all of our eggs in the I believe what they believe basket, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is as soon as they shift on to the new thing, we're going to shift on to the new thing. Our beliefs will shift, and we end up having no convictions at all or having convictions that are built on falsehoods, and we develop a situational ethic when it comes to what we think is right and wrong, and we're not dependable, and we're not consistent, and we become a people of hypocrisy, but more importantly and deeper still is that we become an ungodly people because we're allowing the wrong people to shape what we think and what we believe. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Like we're told that in Scripture, right? Aren't we warned about the values of this world system? We're warned about it all the time. And that doesn't mean, again, that every single thing in the world is evil. Like a, about a Rubik's Cube. That's not evil in and of itself. That's just a fun thing that's a game. But in our culture, there are values and there are worldviews and there are things that, that are, are being pushed and are being pressed that are ungodly. And if that's what we're following and that's what we're building our life on in, in rebellion to what God has to say, then we're headed for a collapse. Think of this as a mountain and a sand dune. What's the difference between a mountain and a sand dune? Well, one of them is a, a stable and permanent topographical feature and the other one comes and goes as the wind blows. You can use one to navigate by. You know, whether you arrived in Kernville five minutes ago or whether you arrived in Kernville 200 years ago, that mountain that sits out here in front of us has still been there. It's been the same thing for the past 200 years, and people have been able to see that and know that they're in the right place. The sand dune, it blows and it moves. You can build on the rock. You can build on the mountain. Sand provides nothing solid. So what Jesus is essentially telling us here is you can receive this teaching and live by it. You know, everything he said, you can receive this and you can live by it. This can be the rock. This can be the foundation upon which your life is built, or you can decide to try it your own way. But the difference is mountain versus sand dune. It's rock versus shifting sand. That's what he is teaching us here. And so it's your choice. You choose which of these foundations you want to build on, but guess what? It's your choice, but it's also your consequence. And this leads us to the last point here, a tale of two results. So the choice we make determines what happens to us, <coughs> the kind of lives we live, and ultimately it determines the kind of impact that we're going to have in this world. In verse 25, this is what he says. He says, the rain fell, the winds came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. In verse 27, and the rain fell and the <coughs> floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell. <coughs> and great was the fall of it. So what happens if we build on the rock? Well, Jesus tells us that we stand firm. If we build on the rock, we are not going to experience that collapse and that fall. Earlier this year, in March of 2023, we had some pretty significant rains and some pretty significant flooding. And a lot of people, like myself, when the flood waters were up, were out and about looking at things. And to the chagrin of the local news, I was out there on the bank filming something, and they went ahead and threw me on the news as they chastised me for being out there. 
But as I was out walking around, I went up to the bluff where Ewing's is, and I was looking down, and something caught my eye. Something interested me. I want you to see this next picture right here. Down here in the waters, you can zoom in on the next one there, there was a, there was a trailer sitting there, and all of Camp Kernville had been put under water. And this one place was sitting here, and it was surrounded by water. And I was convinced. I was convinced. The next time I come, that trailer's not going to be there. It's going to get pulled right off of the foundation. It's going to slam into the bridge. It's going to break apart. And that's going to be the last that dude has of a house. But nine months later, there it still is. Zoom in on this, on this one again. And I want you to look at something about where it's sitting. What do you notice about the foundation? Like it's not sitting on the sand, it's built up, it's on the rocks there, it's, it's stable. And so when the floods came and it's, it's, it's threatening to wash everything else out and it's tearing up all the stuff along the bank, this guy is sitting here surrounded by water and whatever they did on this foundation, it held through the storm. Yeah, multiple pilings, right? And so the one who builds their life, their worldview, their priorities, their values, their actions on God's word is going to be like that trailer. When the floodwaters subside, they are still going to be standing. It's going to hold up. It's like the words of the old hymn, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. But it's on Christ that we can build our lives. And listen, it's, it's not that the storms won't come, but the person who is, is living a life of righteousness, following after Christ, their life is stormproof. The storms are still going to come. They're still going to get hit by the rains. They're still going to get hit by the wind. The difficulties are still going to come, but in the, on the far side of that, they are going to be standing. We can experience peace and joy in this life. You know, as we're in, in the Christmas season now, those are two words that get brought up a lot, peace and joy, because Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and we're told to rejoice at His coming, and, and he, the, the angels brought good tidings of great joy. We can experience peace and joy in this life because we have the promise of Christ that regardless of what happens to us and what we go through, if we have built our life on the solid rock of the Word of God, that we are going to stand regardless of what comes against us. Proverbs 10.25 says, when the tempest passes, the wicked is no more, but the righteous is established forever. So if the life is built on the word of God, it is a life that will stand firm. But on the flip side, the other result is an epic collapse. I want you to take a look at this picture up here. This is not from California, but it might as well be, right? This is a house that was sitting on the, on the bluff over Lake Michigan, and storms came, and the house fell right off the edge. Those of you that are from like the Los Angeles area, I'm sure you're familiar with this. You have all those people that built on the, on the bluff on the Pacific, and now it's eroding out, and you've got houses that are threatening to fall off the edge there. The storms come, and the, the wind blows, and the rains come, and it erodes the foundation, and it collapses. And it's a disaster, and it's precisely what awaits all of those who put all of their weight and their hope in doing things their own way and neglect God's truth and God's instruction. Now, we may get away with it for a while. We may get away with, with living our own way and doing our own thing for a while, but eventually we're going to come to that wall, we're going to hit that point where we realize that I can't keep doing this. And I don't know if you guys here have ever seen somebody's life collapse, but it is a gruesome thing. When you do pastoral ministry, you, you observe this. And it's one of the ugliest and one of the hardest things that we ever go through is that somebody will come to us and they will say, I'm going through this difficulty, I'm going through this trial, and you will take and you will sit down and you will walk them through God's word and you will tell them what God's word has to say and then they will make the choice. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try this my own way. And then you have a front row seat to the downward spiral and the epic collapse of a life. And it's an ugly thing. A life built on a shaky foundation is really just one trial away from unraveling. And even if we somehow manage to keep it all together here, eventually we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and all of those works and all of those things that we've built on that foundation and everything that we think we accomplished, it's all ultimately going to collapse because that's what Jesus says is going to happen. We are not made to attempt this life without Christ. 
We're meant to know him. We're meant to serve him. We're meant to experience his love. We're meant to find our security and our strength in him as we walk in his way. That's what Jesus has been teaching us from the beginning of chapter 5 to the end of chapter 7, that our life needs to be built on the truth of God's word. That needs to govern our decisions. That needs to govern the way that we interact with other people. That needs to govern every single thing that we do in this life. The guarantee of trials and difficulties, the choice of these two foundations, and then the results of what happens when we build on one of them are all revealed here. And what we see is that the desire of Christ is that all who would hear this message, all who would listen to this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, would come to the point where they realize there is a right gate to walk through. There is a right road to walk on. There is a right foundation to build on. And his desire is that each and every one of us would live out our lives in accordance with his words and have our lives built on the rock. Because the storms are coming the difficulty, the challenges, they're coming. Whether we've experienced them now or not, and we need to have our life founded on the word of God. So with this, look at the final two verses of the sermon. It says, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. It says that as these people finished hearing what we've been going over for the last five months, it says that they were astonished. And what it tells them is that they recognized there was a difference in the things Jesus was saying, in the things that they had heard from their preachers, from their scribes, from their teachers. These people, they had been teaching their own opinions or they had been teaching what the the Pharisees would oftentimes do is they would go to a passage of scripture and they would read it and then they would say, Rabbi Shmuel's version of this or opinion on this was this and and Rabbi so-and-so's was this and this and they would just go and they would just give all kinds of opinions on it and Jesus comes in and for the first time they hear somebody speaking authoritatively saying, this is the way to live, this is the right path, this is where blessing comes from, this is how you live a life of consequence. And it says they recognized that his was a teaching with authority. And the word that's used there for authority, it's the word exousia. And this word is a power or authority that comes by right. They were realizing this is not a a political pundit who's talking about life. This is a king who has authority and he is commanding that we live this certain life. And this is ultimately where the Sermon on the Mount has to end. This is ultimately what we have to come to as we close this thing out, is we have to ask the question, who is Christ and does he have the authority over my life? That's the thing that we have to settle in our minds. Is Christ just a life coach? Is he just a guru or a counselor? Is he a pundit or a commentator on life? Or is he the king of kings and lord of lords? Because where we land on who he is is going to determine whether or not we realize that these words are authoritative or not. These people, they listened to the sermon. They, they comprehended that these are words that have authority. They finally knew, what does it mean to be a kingdom citizen? You know, for, for, for ages prior to this being spoken, these people were looking for a king and a kingdom. They were expecting that a king would come, a Messiah would come, and they expected that just by virtue of being Jewish people, they were in, that they were part of that kingdom, that they would be kingdom citizens. But Jesus flipped the script and he taught them what it really means to be a kingdom citizen, what it really means to follow after God, what it really means to reflect and follow the Messiah. So now they knew, and many of these people, they recognized that authority and they followed after him. And now that we've gone through this, we know what it means to be a kingdom citizen. We know what is required of us, but ultimately the choice and the decision that we have to come to is what will we do with that? What does Jesus say in here? He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. This morning, I want to encourage each and every one of you to draw a line in the sand and to make a choice. The king's path or your own way. 
follow after what Christ has taught, or continue to try to figure it out on your own. And if you've been trying to figure it out on your own so far, how's that going for you? I would venture it's not going great. So he puts this in front of us. Christ is our firm foundation, the rock on which we stand. So let's live in obedience as citizens of a glorious kingdom and as followers of a good and gracious king. He has so graciously given us this kingdom manifesto so that we would know how we should live our lives, to live lives of consequence and to live lives of blessing. So let's make the choice as his followers that we're going to not only listen to the word, we're not just going to be hearers of the word, but let's be doers of the word and let's follow Christ's way with all of our heart and all of our life. Amen? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. And Lord, we're grateful to you for everything that you have taught us. Just three short chapters of Scripture but it's the core, of, it's the core of, of what you taught on this earth. Lord, you, you taught us how to live our lives. Lord, you taught us how to honor you. You taught us what it means to be a dedicated follower. And Lord God, I pray that that would be our heart, that that would be our desire, that we would be a people who want to follow after you and want to live for you because we realize that, that your words are life. Lord, it makes me think of John chapter 6 where so many people were abandoning you and you said to the disciples, you said, do you also want to leave? And they said, where else will we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we realize this is true, that your words lead to eternal life, but more more so, Lord, they, they lead to a life of consequence here. And so, Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would be dedicated to following after you and learning from you and being obedient to you because we are citizens of your kingdom. Lord, let us walk with you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
firm foundation and if we build our lives upon Christ and upon his word we will stand in all the trials and in all the difficulties will we avoid them no we're going to have them but we'll stand in them so let's make Christ our firm foundation let's build our life on his word let's take what we've learned over the last 20 weeks and let's put it into practice in our lives and live our lives for him amen all right, we're going to end our service in the way that we always do, and that is to take an offering. If the Lord has placed it on your heart to contribute to the ministries of this church or to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering or to Project Amplify or any of those different things, then you can just take your offering and drop it in one of the receptacles on either side of the door on your way out this morning, and that will be a blessing. So thank you for being here. It is wonderful to see you. Welcome back, all of you that have been gone for a bit. We're glad to have you here as we are in this Christmas season. Have a wonderful week, and I will meet you all at the door. Mm -hmm.